FOMO, the fear of missing out. Now this is what is happening in the industry, right? Every time you get a new language, the development team or the company wants to move from the old language to the new one. Happens with the framework as well. Now you're using a Sturge framework and now you want to use Spring framework. You are using this particular framework for JavaScript and now we got a new one. This is happening with all the industry and it happens for the architecture as well. Now, the moment we get microservices, most of the projects or companies are thinking about, hey, can we just move from monolith to microservices? They don't even understand the implications of it. Of course, everything is good, but every new technology comes with a trade-off. So as a team, as a company, you have to understand if you are moving to a particular technology, the first question you should ask yourself is, should we move? And why we are moving? Just because there's a hype in the market, you want to upgrade, uh, not a good idea. Now, same thing is happening with Python as well. Uh, we got Mojo and then we are thinking, okay, Mojo is the next big thing and it will replace Python. The thing is, look at your use case, look at your project and then decide which language you want to choose, which framework you want to work with and what architecture you are using. And it's not a bad idea to move from new to old again. And this has been proven by Amazon. So there's an article from Amazon about Prime Video. And in this particular video, we are talk going to talk about that particular news. So let's get to the article and let's understand what this article means. And for that, we need help. And that's why we have Ashish here. So Ashish, you can introduce yourself. Sure. Hey friends. Hello. So myself, Ashish Khatri, and uh, I have more than 10 plus, plus years of experience in the IT industry. And uh, I'm working for a product-based company in Bangalore. So yeah, thanks. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Now, the thing is, Ashish actually worked on microservices for a long time and I thought, this is the best time to get him on the platform. Okay, so by doing this, they were able to save 90% of the cost, right? Now, does that mean we have to move from microservices to monolith now? In fact, you know, last week when I went to uh, one of the conference and they were talking about microservices and then monolith. So we think them as a binary, either you have to choose this or that. And then I, I got to heard, hear the new, new word, which is called uh, uh, modulith which is basically a combination of microservices hybrid. and hybrid, yeah, hybrid one. <laughs> so what is your take on this? Since you are working for a company, a product-based company, and you're using microservices there. So how do you decide, should we move this project from a monolith to microservices or should we stay on, micro on monolith? Sure, I think that's a very interesting question, Naveen. And to answer this question, if I share my previous experiences, experiences in my previous companies, so there are a lot of legacy applications in the market. And there are a lot of players who are trying to move or migrate their application to the Microsoft architecture. So mm -hmm. obviously it's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. It has to be happen in a, in a phase by phase manner. And which, but I have seen the common trend when they are migrating, they always start first uh, exposing two to three services mm -hmm. to the rest. And then they <coughs> play kind of a hybrid architecture. Okay, how these three services are working, what are the cost factors and how much scalable it is. Mm -hmm. But they, they're never gonna move the entire application to the microservice architecture. Okay. That is the key thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it takes a lot of analysis before even developing an MVP product, which we call the most viable product. Yeah. Because I experienced this in one of my previous companies, they were developing the MVP product mm -hmm. for their own website. And even that was happening in a phase by phase manner. So it has a lot of modules like let's say, they have to fetch the price. So we are writing a separate service for price microservices. Mm -hmm. If they want to fetch any, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, the stock related uh, uh, information for the product, whether it's in stock or out stock, so they used to write a, a in stock microservices. Mm -hmm. But internally, these microservices are basically communicating each other. Right. Now the now the picture gets more interesting when one microservice is calling the other microservices, yeah. and there's a lag also, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where there are a lot of things to consider before mm -hmm. migrating from a monolithic to microservices. Right. And this case study has given us so many learnings and takeaways that first evaluate all the pros and cons. Mm -hmm. And it depends on your use case as well, your domain as well, like how much real time data mm -hmm. you need, how much scalable application are you looking for to build, right? Yeah. So there are a lot of factors which we have to consider, like how much reliable your application you want to be, right? Availability of the application. There mm -hmm. are, so there are a lot of factors. Obviously, I understand that like, there are challenges with the monolithic which I have observed in my career span. Mm -hmm. And when I migrated towards the microservice, I saw like a lot of benefits as well. But it is not like that blindly we can move on to the microservices. That's not going to happen anytime. True. 
Okay, so let's get to this article and let's understand what this is. In fact, to reduce the time or to save the time, uh, can you just give a glimpse what exactly this tool we're talking about, the service we're talking about? Sure. I'll just uh, put the problem statement in two lines. Like, Amazon had a problem of uh, detecting the uh, default in videos. They have a video streaming service, which we all know, Amazon Prime Video. And they built up a system to detect the defaults in the live streaming videos, which are being published to the customers. Now, they had various architecture, which they initially thought, okay, this is going to work because they were zeroing on the microservice architecture, which mm -hmm. is a buzzword these days. Yeah. And later on, they found so many glitches in the architecture and some performance optimization happened. So this is just the high level overview of this, just to set the context. Oh, cool. In fact, I have seen a lot of uh, streaming services out there nowadays. We got Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and then we got Hotstar, and then in India as well, we got so many services now. And every time you see these streaming services, you think, how they are working so perfectly, especially when the cricket match happens, where we had World Cup, now we have IPL on Geo Cinema, right. and when you go to the uh, viewership of 1.5 crore, still it works. <laughs> so of course, they have a good, amazing tool behind the scene, uh, which is checking all this stuff. So let's go to this article and let's understand. So I have a lot of sure. questions on this and uh, you can help me here. So basically it says uh, Amazon Prime Video, everyone knows about it, it's, it's very famous. And they provide live streaming to the customers. Now, of course, when you say live streaming is not just a recorded session or recorded movie, which they stream you. It's also, they're also talking about live streaming. And uh, of course they have to monitor this, they have to solve uh, the problems. And so the problem can be of block corruption or right. audio video syncing. And the, the amazing thing is they already had a tool, right? Video analytics right, tool. Right. Uh, but they were using it only for a small number of users. Right. Not it was not scaled to that level. Yeah, that's yeah. correct. Okay. And then uh, to achieve this, they were using a microservice, if I'm not wrong. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's what it says here. And then uh, the initial version of the service consisted of distributed component that was orchestrated by a AWS step functions. Right. So let me just understand what this AWS tech function is. Yeah, are. so basically it's a, again service built up in AWS, offered by AWS. And these functions, they provide an uh, environment where you can basically orchestrate the entire thing. And like they, what they used, if I talk about their architecture, they were using the um, AWS Lambda function to trigger the function, to mm -hmm. trigger the, the entire stuff. And then they had various uh, AWS step functions to basically uh, have the uh, microservices deploy on the uh, compute systems. Okay. And the problem with this system was like they were using the uh, Amazon uh, AWS S3 bucket where they were basically processing the videos mm -hmm. which were getting streamed, they, they yeah. were processing the frames and they were storing in a bucket. So yeah. this is the diagram we're talking about. Right, that's correct. This is the one. And now if you see this architecture, the problem or the challenge which they faced was that when they were pulling the video frames Mm -hmm. to detect the default in that video, mm -hmm. they were making the request, so many, several requests to this S3 bucket. And that was quite expensive. Now, another problem which they faced was to orchestrate this entire architecture, mm -hmm. like how the data is flowing among the uh, services. And if you see that they have the concurrent uh, microservices playing on in the architecture. Mm -hmm. And now later on, they will send the publishing events about the aggregated results. Like, mm -hmm. okay, what are the results or what are the flaws or the glitches in this entire video. Okay. So this was the entire architecture. So the two bottlenecks which they faced about this architecture was first to manage the orchestration part, mm -hmm. which was very expensive. And the second thing was that when they were making the request to the S3 bucket to pull the video frames. So that was quite expensive. Okay, cool. And uh, so they solved this problem and they got 90% of saving now. Right, that's correct. And they moved to a new architecture. So before we show the new architecture, do we have, are we missing something here? So now they are basically using EC2 and ECS. Right. Right. So EC2 is basically a, a place where you can deploy your application. It That's works. correct. That's correct. ECS is a container service. Container right? service. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And now they have moved to the new new service or monolithic application basically. Yeah. And it's it sounds strange, you know. Normally when you hear the news, it says, okay, now we have moved from monolith to microservices. Right. It's strange to hear this type of news. Great. I think I think this this entire stuff it got so much attention of the people because uh, even a lot of techies they feel okay they have a FOMO okay I think if I'm not working on the microservices maybe I'm missing out something in the market or I will not be the updated guy right. but again like if we talk about the upscaling stuff which a lot of folks are looking forward 
to upgrade themselves their microservices or the cloud so the only thing they have to keep with themselves they have to just build on their strong fundamentals right. whether it's microservices monolith but they have to have the awareness about the recent trend setters whereas how it was built earlier mm -hmm. so now when i started my career i was totally working on the monolithic architecture so we had our entire er file where we were putting all our jsps and web xml everything was clipped there java code everything was there as part of that entire er file but now when we moved when we migrated towards the microservice architecture we had a lot of jar files clipped for each and every microservices whether it's fetching some product info or anything like that now the thing is like when we think about moving or migrating to the uh, the microservice architecture we have to very thorough with the design mm -hmm. we have to think all the perspective of the design or the cost perspective and even how mu how much we can make this application scalable because microservice always grab the attention okay if we are, if i have to scale something obviously i have to move that entire architecture to the microservices right. but i think that was a myth which has been broken today <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> cool and now this is a new architecture if i'm not wrong right that's correct so can you just help me what are things changed here sure so what they have done is like they have clubbed all the microservices as part of one container service mm -hmm. and they are leveraging the amazon ecs which is the the container services mm -hmm. offered by amazon and entire stuff is clubbed in this ecs okay. instance now earlier they were uh, vertically sorry horizontally scaling the microservice let's say they need one more microservice for mm -hmm. one more detector they want to club mm -hmm. they used to plug in that uh, microservice in in the entire orchestration system but now it is scalable vertically right by vertical by vertically i mean to say like they, if they have like let's say three more detector so they will only deploy only on that particular container instance okay they won't move to any other uh, further container instances or they won't deploy on any other infrastructure mm -hmm. so earlier the infrastructure was separate yeah. which was also a cost mm -hmm. to the company now they have reduced it only to one particular instance yeah. okay. and the second thing which i want to highlight mm -hmm. navin here that Uh, earlier they were using the amazon s3 bucket yeah. to pull the video frames right. right and to detect the defects but now ev everything like the entire processing to detect that is happening within the memory and they have written a light orchestration layer mm -hmm. within that ecs instance which is part of that ecs instance and there is no more extra cost of orchestrating the entire system as well okay so that's important don't get into fomo just because we have a new technology and we have to advance that of course you know you should understand the technology so that when you look at your use case you have to understand okay do we have to go for this or we have to go for that uh, in fact people who are into a cto role it's very important for them uh, people who are into the architect role they have to understand the technology it's not like you have to use it you have to understand the technology first so yeah that's about this video where we have talked about uh, the new news from the amazon prime video and thank you so much ashish for this Thanks. valuable time and uh, i hope uh, people have learned a lot of different terms here from this article and from ashish and hopefully ashish will come back for some more interesting talk thanks to me thanks the for the school. invitation and i hope it added some value to the yeah. viewers thank you so much thanks